1620, while the Mayflower was in Provincetown, 18 of its men sailed in a small shallop, searching for a place to live. They came to present-day East Ham, where they were met by a group of Nosset. After a brief but violent encounter, the English left towards today's Plymouth. In 2020, we remember this first encounter. We explore its meanings for today and tomorrow. Good evening, welcome to our Sunset Series. Uh, tonight, we're really happy to be uh, speaking with Lee Roscoe, who is a journalist, an environmental educator, a playwright, her two most uh, recent uh, journal articles are in the annual issue of Provincetown Arts 2020. A wonderful article on the reclamation of the Wampanoag language and another on Wampanoag arts, which I have read both, they're excellent, and now I present you Lee Roscoe. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> so, Wampanoag arts and artisans, traditional to transitional. For the Wampanoag, as with all indigenous cultures of Turtle Island, art is not separated from life nor spirit from material. There is none of the European ethic of dominance over earth. Rather, everything has spirit, is alive, and humans are no better and no worse than everything in nature. Art results from supplying needs in season with hands and body from earth. It was created not to hang on a wall without a use, but an integral part of providing the basics of food, shelter, clothing, ceremony, and entertainment. It is in the we to the home, that all the arts are encompassed. White cedar saplings collected in spring when they are flexible to bend are set with prayer and ceremony for each step of the way. There were summer we twos, usually close to the shore for planting corn and fishing, about 15 feet across and 12 feet high. And there were winter we twos or longhouses with a fire within for each family occupying it. A typical nush we too is a three fire house about 30 feet long by 20 by 12 feet high. Houses were owned matriarchal, matrilineally by the women of the tribe. Indeed, the relationship between the womb as a word for my home and the actual home is profound. As We Too builder Anna Juan Wheaton says, the round form is from nature like eggs or nests, warmer than the boxy houses. It circulates air and it prevents abuse to the structure during storms. Within the We Too are mats and master ma mat maker Julia Martin weaves mats which go inside and outside the summer We Too's. It's a painstaking practice. She says exterior cattail mats are extremely efficient. Rain runs down the reeds, works into the mats, and spins back out. The interior bulrush and exterior cattail mats work together to let the breeze through in hot weather and insulate in cooler weather. Winter homes were bark covered. Martin also creates museum quality twine baskets and bags. Twining, she says, is an ancient art in which you twist more than one strand of weft around one or more wharfs using your fingers and no loom. Fibers of cattail, bulrushes, corn husks, false nettle, butterfly weed, milkweed, dog bane, all local plants, the inner bark of basswood and cedar, dyed with such as blood roots, daghorn, sumac, walnut, and chestnut barks, husks to colors including yellow, orange, red, black, brown, and natural make designs, which are often geometric, floral of the four directions and of the sacred tree of life, Martin says. In the wheat, two pots also are art, clay pots, cook food, store food, and water. Potter Nosa Pocket, Ramona Peters, is a revered elder, former tribal preservation officer, founder of the Native Land Conservancy. She says, pots that I make are culturally informed by my Wampanoag ancestors. The shape is traditional with rounded bottoms which receive heat differently than flat bottoms. The heat is distributed in a circle. She adds, we didn't have square shapes in our culture. She also says there are male and female elements within a pot which express a symbolic representation of the way we were and the way we are. Elizabeth James Perry creates traditional wampum artifacts. Most have ceremonial significance. Wampum is very much of the sea crafted as it is from shells of clam and whelk. 
the connection to water, sea, and sky confers great spiritual power to it, embodying, Perry says, a complementary duality, which is an essential part of indigenous belief. Wampum also embodies, she says, a lot of star symbolism going back to ancient traditions, and it is about sharing abundance and taking care of our ancestors and the next generation. A new ceremonial wampum belt has been created by the tribe and is now exhibited for the Plymouth 400th at the Box Museum in the UK. Project organizer Paula Peters of Smoke Signals says it's inspired by the quest for an old wampum belt, a royal one belonging to the Wampanoag sake of Metacom or King Philip, lost likely to the British after King Philip's War of 1675-76 which ended tragically with many natives sent into slavery and Metacom's heads savagely displayed on a pike at Plymouth. The tribe is hopeful that this wampum belt is recovered and repatriated. Also, clothing is art, and some clothing is for daily coverage, but some is for use in ceremony or powwow dancing, such as the famed jingle dresses of the Anishinaabe, which have curative powers. Some clothing has symbols on that indicating such as status, clan affiliation, personal vision, tribal history, even as wampum can. Many wampanoag create their own regalia, but many go to clan mother Anita Peters, or Mother Bear, who's Ramona's sister, for regalia. Anita says that in the past, hides were brain tanned, sewn with bone needles, and designs were painted from minerals of graphite, red, yellow, red and yellow ochre, ground up, mixed with bear fat, applied with a little stick. Now I can go to Joanne's Fabrics, and there are not many bears there, she quips. Adornment also has great meaning and great artistry. Jonathan James Perry, who's a Quinn Wampanoag and Elizabeth's brother, creates pipes and adornment that are both traditional and modern using ancient and modern techniques in metal, rock, stone, and bone. Perry's pieces reflect Wampanoag philosophy and belief also. For example, a pendant entitled Balanced Face is, according to his website, a hand-carved face effigy on ivory with scrimshaw, serpent, thunderbird, and traditional tattoo designs. He tells me that all Algonquian belief is similar. It is balance, the duality of the above world and the below world. It's like why you braid your hair. You are bringing together mind, body, and spirit every day. Artists such as Emma Jo Mills Brennan and Robert Peters, who is a cousin of Nosopoket and Mother Bear, transition from traditional arts to modern, creating standalone art, which is influenced by traditional themes. Peter says of the art in his book, 13 Moons, a meditation on indigenous life. I want to depict the way we are now, not the past, although the past informs the present through the continuation of traditions, particularly ceremonial ones. Peter's art is infused with visions and mystical events he has experienced. He paints with acrylic, but practiced for three years drawing only in pen gives his art incredible precision. His work is beloved by his fellow tribespeople and adorns many of their homes and workplaces. Emma Jo is a musician who composes her work for native flute played on a flute no suppoke it created for her on her Breath of Prayer CDs. But she's also a multimedia artist whose work is deeply in influenced by nature, color, and light. Its themes are of her tribe as with a gouache print of a basket on the beach which is an offering of cornmeal or shellfish. Or for instance, one sustains us, one does not, a uh, fabric art at Mashby Wampanoag Museum. She says, I chose to show all the wildlife covered by a golf course. I used to go to that bog ditch with a cousin when we were young. The ditch was black with pollywogs. Did they inform anyone before they just filled it in? We just cover life, life like that, she says, forgetting to honor the beauty of creation. The list of vibrant Wampanoag artists is long, and I by no means cover them all in these few minutes. There are founding artisans such as the late Gladys Woodis, who popularized multicolored pottery from the Gay Head Cliffs of Aquina. 
and many vendor hoops of the same area practicing pottery and wampum jewelry. There are wampum jewelry creators like Marcus Hendricks and Carol Lopez and her daughter and Hartman Deeds. There are multi-talented twiners, potters, and regalia makers such as Carrie Ann Helm, Marlene Lopez, and Linda Coombs. There are Michoon and bow and arrow makers such as Philip Wynn Many Hands, and there are artisans like Darius Coombs, who heads the Wampanoag program now at Plymouth Plantation. If you want to see some Wampanoag arts during the 400s, they may be seen at the Atwood House Chatham Pilgrim Monument Museum in Provincetown, the Mashpee Wampanoag Museum, and various historical societies such as Wealthy, as well as at the Cape Cod National Seashore Visitor Center headquarters at Salpung Visitor Center, and of course, at Plymouth Plantation. You know, all depending on COVID. Thank you so much and support Wampanoag Arts and the tribe. My name is Joanna Hollick and I'm the coordinator of the Sunset Series with East Ham 400. I'd like to thank you for all of your support of the Sunset Series over the past few months. Although the Sunset Series is drawing to a close, this is not the end of East Ham 400 events. In the coming months, we will hold a variety of different events and programs. An example of such programs is a sunrise service that will be taking place at 7 a.m. on December 8th, the 400th anniversary of the first encounter. I encourage you to check East Ham 400's website, www.easthamm400.org, to stay updated on upcoming events and other projects that we are working on. Thank you. <laughs>